Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. If you please join me in a moment of silence. Thank you very much. Welcome to tonight's meeting. The first item on our agenda tonight uh, relates to citizen concerns. And this portion of the meeting is for anyone who would like to address the board on a topic that is not otherwise on the agenda. Are there any citizen concerns at this time? Yes, sir, if you'd uh, please approach and state your name and address and then the nature of your concern. Thanks for being here. My name is Harold Fight. My wife and I live at 2526 Highway 20 in Lawton. Thank you, sir. Go ahead. Uh, on October 6th of this year, a couple of weeks ago, my wife and I became aware that an assessment of our home done in March of 2016 was based upon assumed information. I have before me all the material relating to that. It seems that due to a listing of our real estate price, we had our house for sale in 2015. The assessor came out in March, and when no one was home, made the assumption that due to the price of the house, there must be a finished basement in that house. We have no finished basement. In fact, the assessors came back at 3 o'clock in the afternoon of October 6th, went through the house and saw that the basement was unfinished, just the way it was, built in 2003. Now, we have a tax burden due this March based on that assessment in March of 2016, based on this grossly assumption off of a real estate ad. And our point to the board here is that we understand taxes go up. We want to pay our taxes fairly. We have no problem paying our taxes. We don't want to pay our taxes on the basis of assumptions. It's poor business. It doesn't reflect good government. So we might have a credit for what we're due to pay in March of 2018 based upon that assumed evaluation. Thank you very much. I appreciate your input to the board. We do have our assessor w with us this evening if she'd like to address in response. And one thing just to clarify, sir, and, and, and this can also be a, a point of clarification, going forward, my uh, understanding at this point is that those taxes have been corrected from here on out, in other words, in yes, future I'm years. Yes, we run them through the Board of Review this next year. Okay. So the next tax statement that they receive in September will be corrected. Okay, thank you very much. So now to anything that you want to respond to and um, help to the, the board. The protocol for the assessor's office is we monitor all sales listings, um, Craigslist, Facebook, and this property came up and first we were $100,000 under assessed and then we were $70,000 under assessed. Our protocol is to flag these parcels, go out, see if there's anything different. Usually, 95% of the time, it's a basement finish that no one has gotten a permit for and picked up. Um, we did leave a door hanger on 216 of 17 for the property owner. Uh, my two appraisers were in the car, watched the property owner take it out, shut the door. Um, then. On 316, we did send them out an assessment notice. I have a copy here of the assessment notice. There are dates on here to appeal if he did not agree to this value. No one did appeal to that assessment notice. Um, in code section 441.24, if a person refuses to furnish the assessor with the information that they need, they shall proceed to list and assess the property according to the best obtainable information. Um, as soon as he called and set up an inspection, or no, excuse me, he came into the office. We went out immediately that day. We corrected the basement finish. I agreed to run it through the Board of Review so he does not have to pay taxes for the next year. Legally, there is nothing I can do as far as his taxes due to the fact that he did receive an assessment notice and he did not protest during the time. Thank you very much. And now my next question is going to be go, going to my left, your right, to our assistant county attorney. And the question will be, legally, there's nothing that the assessor can do. We have been in a somewhat similar situation, not 
um, based on the city assessor okay. and, and an error, and I'm not saying this was an error in the particular. Um, there seems to be some um, confusion on what happened, but what legally can the Board of Supervisors do or not do in this situation? I know the assessor's hands are tied except for future assessments. Um, so what can we or can we not do? Okay. I'd just like to say this, um, Acting Chair. Um, I don't think this, this is appropriate venue to resolve this dispute. Okay. Um, we will certainly look into it, talk with you know, the agreed party as well as our assessor's office okay. during the week and try to work this out, but I just don't think this Then you can come back with a recommendation right. if there's something that we can do, um, and we will do what is in our power. Um, but I want to make sure that it's within the confines of what we can or cannot do legally. So uh, you will be owed a, a response on behalf of our county attorney and board of supervisors um, in order to follow up with you folks. So we appreciate you being here. Um, that doesn't resolve your issue for tonight, but you have our assurance that we will follow up and see with the, what's within the purview of the board to do. May I make a final point? If you'd approach, uh, absolutely. However, no one at my house, myself included, ever denied anyone who appeared in person entry into the house. Now, our house faces the northeast, and whatever hangar you may put anywhere on the front porch, any wind over 15 miles an hour, that hangar is going to be in the next county. A letter would be probably more appropriate, which anybody would respond to. We're not here complaining about the fact that taxes go up. I didn't come back to you during the April period because the taxes went up. I came here today because the taxes were assessed on an assumption basis a real estate ad. <clears throat> and quite frankly, to the Board of Supervisors, that sounds like poor business, that you get taxed on an assumption. I rest. Thank you very much. Appreciate you folks addressing. Thank you for being here and, and giving uh, us another perspective. And we will uh, owe you a response in the, in the near future. Thank you very much, Mr. County Attorney. Any other citizen concerns that are, uh, are due the board at this time that are not related to something that's on the agenda? Hearing none, I, yes. I just got one quick one, Chairman. Um, during 2016, I came to the board on this particular topic, which is we were applying for a grant. We got like 12 community partners trying to um, respond to victims of domestic violence, you know, both our assessment, corrective action, um, as well as any issues that they may have. Um, I'm just here to tell you today I'm happy to announce that we have received that grant and we will be meeting all of our partners um, to assess our next steps. And at that point, I will be expected to come back to the board requesting permission to initiate the hiring position um, because we received funding for a part-time uh, assistant county attorney to work specifically on, on this particular grant. So, Very good. Thank you for sharing that. appreciate the work uh, that you're doing on that. <clears throat> Any other citizen concerns? Hearing none, we are to the approval of the agenda, and I would move approval of that agenda. Second. There's a motion and a second by Radig. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Those aye. opposed say no. And the motion carries five to zero. Uh, for the good of the audience, Supervisor Ong is with us telephonically from... Curacao. What was that? Curacao, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much. I'm not sure where that's at, but some undisclosed location. Thank you. Sounds like he's on a carousel. A carousel, okay. We are to the consent agenda, so items three through six constitute a consent agenda of routine action items to be considered by one motion. These items will pass unanimously unless a separate vote is requested by a board member. I'll read through these. Uh, number three, approval of the minutes of the October 10th, 2017 meeting. Approval of the minutes of the October 6th, 2017 special meeting. Approval of the minutes of the October 12th, 2017 special meeting. Number four, approval of the claims. Number five, uh, human resources, approval of the memorandum of personnel transactions. 
and B, authorizing the chairman to sign the authorization to initiate the hiring process. Six, under County Auditor A, is to receive David Folsom as clerk of Willow Township, and B, is to receive Daniel Folsom as a Willow Township trustee. I move to approve the consent agenda. Second. There's a motion and a second to approve the consent agenda. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed say no, and the motion carries five to zero. We are now to the regular agenda, and item number seven uh, is under myself. It's approval to have the Woodbury County Board of Supervisor liaisons to the governing board move at the next governing board meeting that the Sioux Rivers Regional MHDS dissolve and terminate. I'll make some opening comments. We'll ask then if there's any board discussion, then we'll open it up to public input. Uh, the reasons for this motion and these are at the advice of legal counsel. Um, the first, termination of the region is a more desirable outcome than withdrawal by Woodbury County for all member counties. Uh, and just to give you a little background, if you look at the 2080 agreement, uh, the 2080 agreement uh, asked for withdrawal by November 15th, and most of the other 2080 agreements also ask for entrance into another region by November 15th. So there's a timeline we're up against. Typically that's to be ahead of the budget season. I think it is in uh, the best interest of Sioux and Plymouth County as well um, because they have seen that this board has already voted to withdraw by a majority vote. And withdrawal will likely necessitate termination anyway because Sioux and Plymouth County cannot stand alone as a region. We had a discussion with DHS Director Foxhoven as well as Gretchen Kramer and Rick Schultz and, and it's clear that uh, the direction of DHS is to move toward larger regions, not toward smaller. And in fairness and in uh, abundant transparency, they made it clear Woodbury County will not be allowed to stand alone. That was a question that we had asked. There is nothing within Iowa Code that allows for it right now. Um, and Polk County is the only special case that made it as the one of four. So the 2080 agreement has more detailed procedures for winding up the region upon termination than upon a member's uh, withdrawal as well. And I think it's fair to both Sioux and Plymouth County um, to begin looking in that process. I've made it clear there's no animus towards either Plymouth or Sioux. In fact, if Plymouth or Sioux wanted to petition to become a part of Rolling Hills to our east, there's no objection. Um, we are not approaching them collectively as a team, but we have no um, problem if they would petition to go either east or north, um, as we are looking either east or south. And so with that, um, I also just want to make some other clarifying comments, and then I want to let you know that we have voted to allow withdrawal, but we have not withdrawn because that takes written notice to the governing board. What I'm asking for tonight is allowance for supervisors Radig and myself to be able to move at the next governing board meeting that the region dissolve and terminate and that we go our separate ways. So let me just make a few other clarifying comments. Um, we wanna keep at the forefront any discussion that mental health services are not going away um, despite some of the fear that may be out there that we will keep high quality mental health services at the forefront in our discussions um, with both Rolling Hills um, as well as Southwest Iowa. Um, I also want to let you know uh, a couple other things that I think are important. Um, this is not about one issue, this is about many issues over the last three years. Um, under then Chairman Mark Munson, who asked to uh, raise the prospect first, uh, then under myself, as chair, now under Chairman Ong and, and Supervisor Radig. Um, there's no coincidence that four different supervisors um, from both parties have, have looked at leaving the region um, for a variety of reasons. We've covered them the last two weeks, um, so I won't rehearse all of them um, tonight. But those are the opening comments, and then I would open it up uh, for any board discussion, and then I'd open it up to any public comment before we... <coughs> 
vote. You would probably want to clarify its effective June 30th at the end of the budget year. Of right, right, and that's a good point. So all of this is to say that anything that's in the 2080 agreement currently, um, including all the funding that has been promised, and I'm asking and hoping Sioux and Plymouth counties will honor what's in the budget right now, but that will go through June 30th. As we have said, all funding, and we have talked about this uh, at length, has not changed during this current fiscal year through June 30th, so thank you for the point. Other questions, comments, discussion, Supervisor Potter? I just a couple, and you already answered one of them when sure. you said this was through legal advice. Our county attorneys have been involved with this. Outside legal counsel, the Heidman Law Firm. Oh, okay. Just for this issue? Yes, and extensively. They've navigated the process for the last three years, and it's something that we've utilized them for for the last three years. Okay, I, I wasn't aware of that. I thought you just used our county attorney. But yeah. Okay. My, my question, and I guess it might be more to Dennis, if we withdraw and they don't vote to dissolve and terminate, are we going to lose any money up there? Are we going to leave anything on the table? Maybe you know better than Yeah, so, so it's, it's a legal... Yeah, I was going to say, maybe... Yeah, it's a legal, legal question. Here's the, here's the legal conundrum. There could be an argument to be made that a member that withdraws um, loses the funding property and so on. That's why we're asking for dissolution, because we think that it makes sense if the three counties know that this isn't going to work, to sit down and come to agreements on what was put in what will be taken out. They can't stand alone. So uh, the way that uh, DHS characterized it is it would leave two orphan counties. Um, it clearly can't be a region. And so by virtue of that, instead of having the legal argument um, with them and a protracted one at that, that I think would be in nobody's best interest, I think the solution would be better. Well, that, and that was my biggest fear is if we did this, if we were to lose money. Yeah. And because the next question won't be until we get to the next step, joining a new region, if that's going to cost us more, but that's down the line somewhere. Right, right. Other questions, comments? Sure, if you'd approach the podium. Name it, name it. Jim Rixner, 114 Midville Avenue, Thank you. City, Iowa. My question in terms of clarification is pretty direct and pretty simple. If you go to the region and the region votes not to let you withdraw, is that the rationale that you have changed this resolution? No. Because they could do that. And, and that would not be binding. Nothing prohibits, and this is at the advice of legal counsel, nothing prohibits a member of withdrawing, which I think is a good thing because you can't be held hostage. Right? Well, no, and I agree with all of that, but, but my point is, according to how I thought the 28E agreement read, and I did read it, that I thought you had to have the vote, a majority vote, to accept someone from withdrawing. You do not? No, and the 28E, which is not a bastion of clarity, and I think right. if we had it to do over again, there is a certain provision early on that says any member may withdraw, and then there's one later on that says it's contingent. Um, we believe that it's clear in the first um, instance that we can withdraw. Okay, so it is a little, little muddled. That's all I'm trying to understand right. because it would seem to me, and I'll sit down, it would seem to me it might be in the interest in Plymouth and Sioux County to not allow Woodbury County to withdraw for all the reasons you've already expressed, which is they cannot stand alone and they may not want to go somewhere else. Right. Just to and, and I think that's a, that's a good point. Um, what I would hope to bring to the region uh, board, which is October 30th now, is I think it's in all of our best interest because of the timeline and planning. And as I've said before, if we end up with Sioux and Plymouth County to our east, there's no issue, at least on my part, or maybe anybody else's. Thank you for your courtesy. Thank you, Mr. Erickson. <coughs> Others from the public that would like to address the board on this issue? Cool. 
My name is Connie Barrett. I'm the advocate for the Sioux Rivers region, Woodbury County, Plymouth County, and Sioux County, uh, hired by all of three of those counties. Um, in all things, there should be a natural flow. There should be anyway. And I feel that God was involved when he made the region of Woodbury, Plymouth, and Sioux. It's my thinking. <laughs> Both counties have good services, and we utilize more services in Plymouth and Sioux than any other counties. When I look at the other regions, I don't see that same flow. The majority of residents placed out of country, out of county, go to Plymouth and Sioux. Those residents both out of the county and in this county are experiencing anxiety because of what you are doing. That was my concern when I stood here two weeks ago and told you that the Sioux River system of service is not broken. They work well together. Why did you not listen to me? <clears throat> Who are you looking out for? I don't feel it's the people of Woodbury County. As I said, we don't utilize services to the east of us. When I was the advocate of three of the seven counties of Rolling Hills, we did use some of their services, but they're no longer, they're no, no longer in existence anymore. I have to believe if they accept you into their region, it will be because they believe Woodbury County taxpayers will help them. Last week, you passed the community of Danbury. You praised them, and I do too. I happen to be born and raised in Danbury. The week before, you were very negative concerning the supervisors of Sioux and Plymouth. I was embarrassed. Why would you not treat them politely? Mr. Ung, who's not here this evening, when you... I'm right here. Where was your respect when you played a tape with just a snippet of a meeting that was only the argument? If you had played the whole tape, you would have, it would have contained the part where Mr. Taylor was trying to get them to buy into something they didn't agree with. Arguments are natural when that's what's going on. You tried to use it as a cause for disbanding. That was wrong, in my belief. Plymouth and Sioux have good services. Their supervisors know that. They don't have to be micromanaged. In the interest of people we serve, you need to change your vote. Thank you. Thank you very much. Supervisor Ong, your name was brought up. Do you want to respond or not? Um, I would say that the point's been missed by someone who would say that. <laughs> the tape was not played to justify cause for disbanding. It was to display what our board meeting was not to be like, and it was successful. Uh, there's been some requests to play more of it. Uh, that's a never-ending invitation because it's taken out of context unless you play the entire two-hour meeting, and that's not something I was going to do. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Ong, sir. Yeah, hi, I'm uh, John Hanla. I live at 304 Bennington Court, Sergeant Bluff, and I'm also the president of Goodwill Industries. Um, we provide services to, through the uh, Sioux Rivers Regional Association, uh, approximately about, to about 100 people. Um, and it's been a good, uh, I think, a good alignment. I think one thing the board ought to consider is that right now with the Sioux Rivers Region, we have one out of three votes. If we go into another larger association, you might have one out of maybe 12 votes. You have more influence in this region than if you go into another region. And um, from my perspective, as one of the human service providers, and I don't want to speak for the others, but I think they might agree, we haven't really been consulted on this or asked. And I think the consideration ought to be, what about the people that we serve? What's the concern about them and how it impacts the organizations? You know, if, if, we, if we have to pull out, goodwill will still continue, but it, the question I have is, how is it going to impact the services of the people of the other agencies and, and goodwills? That's all. Thank you very much. Do you mind if I ask you a couple of questions? Sure. Do you know what? Every year, the, the funding from Sioux Rivers to Goodwill Industries, is there a... I believe it's 45,000? 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, yeah. Okay. And it's, okay. And, and it's being well received. There's going to be good outcomes on that. Okay, thank you very much. Oh, and that, 
Go no, that that was. All right. I just wanted to know that the dollar amount. I appreciate it, and that's one of the things that um, you can be assured of as we talk to um, the different regions and have them look at the services that are provided. And going forward, we believe um, that we'll try to represent those providers well. Um, and I appreciate those those comments. I would say this: um, we're one of three that consistently, I believe. Um, are voted against and so the two to ones um, I can live with if they're consistent I can live with sometimes if we're consulted um, oftentimes that's not the case and, and I think that that becomes increasingly difficult um, I believe that being part of a seven county or 12 county um, board we may have more influence than being part of this one of three but that's just my personal perspective having been there and uh, on the losing end several times. Sir. I'm Dick Owens, 1400 Indian Hills Drive, Sioux City, Iowa. What I want to do today is just do a compare and contrast. We're thinking of pulling out. Let's look at what we had that worked. The first thing, if you look at Woodbury County and you look at where we've got our services, we need 4.3 million in order to keep the services the way we have it. If you look at our leviability, it's 3.1. So we're short over a million dollars. The services have not been cut because a million dollars have come from Plymouth and Sioux County. So if we start to move, we're going to have the same situation. If you go to Reeling, uh, uh, Rolling Hills, we're going to need 4.3 if you want to keep the services. So where is it going to come from? Well, the first thing I assume you're going to do is raise the levy. In order to do that, you're going to raise it out to 14, 15, 16 dollars per capita. You have the same facts. You're still a million short. Add them up. Mr. Owens, would yeah. you mind if our budget analyst responded to you as you make this claim? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. So our budget analyst, um, could you clarify whether or not uh, we're being subsidized annually by Plymouth and Sioux County? It would seem a uh, uh, a tremendous amount that Plymouth and Sioux would be subsidizing. Is it the fact that they're subsidizing us over a million dollars a year or that we're eating into reserves? We are eating into the reserves because we have reserves to eat into at the present time. And what will happen if we continue on the same route for the next two to three years? What will happen to our one time, oh. what, to our ending fund balance? Uh, if we stay on the same path we're on right now, our ending fund balance will be down about zero, according to information I have received. Not only the ending fund balance zero, what, what do you project that it will be eventually in three years? Well, if we go on a path that we're predicted, we'd be in a hole. Okay. And that is not borrowing somehow from Plymouth County um, that is subsidizing us by over a million dollars. Uh, I just want to make well, sure. What will happen in the future, though, our t per capita will eventually get quicker to the maximum we can levy. So taxes will go up severely in Woodbury County. Is that what I'm hearing from yes. you? Yes. Okay. I just want to make sure because I want to clarify when we hear statements like we all have the same data that on record, I want it to be known our budget analyst disagrees with that. Uh, I, thank you. I, you can continue. Done, not today. I will bring my figures, and I'll meet with Mr. Butler. I appreciate that very much. The key is that we're in deficit no matter how we do it. So if you go to Rolling Hills and you're going to keep the same services, and that's about 4.3, so then you're going to have to raise the levy. I assume that's going to be one of the choices. So you raise it 14 to $16 per capita. You're still a million dollars short. And where's that going to come? You've got to cut. You're going to cut. And I would just say, so we're. That, yeah. What are you going to cut? 
I can tell you some that you're going to do. I understand that. One program is going to get cut as the ARC summer program. I'm sure that's going to happen. We serve right now, if you leave the uh, Sioux and Plymouth, we have students from Woodbury County. We have them from those two counties. And we run our program because we can have those joint daughters. When that goes, we're going to lose our program. That's over 100 kids. It would potentially be 150 families that are going to be impacted. Can I ask you again, Mr. Owens, where you're getting your information from that ARC is going to be cut? Because, again, I want to... I'm not capable of finding my own information? No, I'm just asking you to please cite it, because it's important when we say that ARC is going to be cut, I want to know where you have heard that information. It I creates fear. It, but okay, thank some you. Some of them have to get cut. That, that it, and I am assuming that what you're going to do is take some of those that got uh, waved in, waved in, because those are children programs. I assume that's. I've heard different statements from you and Mr. Ong, which made those statements about the core service and so forth. It doesn't matter if it's not the ARC. It's going to be somebody. So what are we going to do? We're going to cut the employment grants. That's a possibility. Possibility, if you go out, is what about the stabilization? As I understand, 28E, that's going to stay if they continue to run that region. And, and just to clarify, we said that they cannot stand alone as a two-county region, but that won't. It is my belief that they'll get a one-year waiver and they will bring somebody in. Everything we're talking about is, is just projection. So my projection are just as valuable as yours. The third thing I want you to think about, if we don't have the stabilization, and if we want to keep those services, they're controlling. We don't even know who's going to manage it. Second thing, as I understand, it's about 400 bucks a day. Woodbury County is a large user of that. So you're not, if you have five or six people, you're looking at thousands of dollars. And why would Siouxland Mental Health not help manage that? We'd let somebody else speak to that. You, or what you're saying, you're not going to use stabilization? I've never said that. I've never said that we're going to cut art. I've never said all of these things that raise this general tenor of fear, but aren't based on any real fact. They are based on reality that we're going to be short a million dollars and things are going to have to get cut. If we stay as we are right now, I agree that we will be in deficit as our budget analyst has if said. If you go to Rolling Hills, if you do what I've said, you're still a million short. And if we go to Southwest Iowa, will our levy rate be guaranteed for five years at a lower rate? Potentially. These are all things that we will take into consideration, but we will keep mental health services at the first and are you foremost. saying you're going to keep them at 4.3 4. million? We don't know. We, don't, we know that we can't go this way. As our budget analyst has said, if we stay in Sioux Rivers without a 400 and some odd thousand dollar deficit. And so, yes, there will have to be some hard choices here as well. That's a reality. I understand that. I've been working in this field for over 70 years. Mm -hmm. So I know a little thing about what we're talking about. If you really look at it, and I'm going to go back to what John said, when you're in a, in a uh, region of three, you go to a region of eight, seven of those counties have been working together. I don't think you're going to get a lot of uh, people saying what you want you're going to get voted for. I really don't think so. Now, the last thing I want to say is almost everybody in this room has been here long enough to know that there's not been this kind of a problem previously. When Jackie Smith was on this board, Larry Clausen was on, I'm sure there was differences, but they were resolved. What I am saying, if I was sitting on this board, and each of you are going to have to make that decision, what we're doing tonight and what we have been doing is not good. It's a mess. And we're not taking into effect the impact this have on persons that need help. We're not doing that. If you think about it, sitting there, honestly, you've said a lot of things that I agree with. Number one, you don't know what's going to happen. 
So why are you going to vote to get out until you figure out something? When I try to make a decision, I think I pretty well know the outcome. If you don't know the outcome, why do you get into it? The next thing to think about is, and I know this is going to be like a lead balloon. Typically, when you have problems in business and you're having differences of opinion, the people that are working, sometimes you just change them. In school, for instance, we have kids that can't work under a teacher. Being a principal, a lot of times we take them out and they get another teacher It works. You have two supervisors sitting right here that have a lot of experience. They've gone through a lot of situations, probably more than, than this one. Before you get out, I would think of it maybe four or five months. I would have two gentlemen that are sitting here to see if they could work with those counties. Now, I know that's a negative, but when you look at a mess to get out of it, I can tell you, if, if we do things like this, this the people of the county will feel like we've really done it correctly. So Are that's you? where I come from. I think if you vote tonight, I don't think that's wise. I think you need to look at another way to solve your problems. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. And just uh, I would note that we did change the chair of the region up there. We also changed the two supervisors who represented Woodbury County. In my mind, the same effect. Anybody else who would like to address the board? I'm Brad Lego at uh, 121346 Street, Sioux City, Iowa. Thank you very much. And I'd like to thank Dr. Owens for standing up here. Um, I'm sure all of you are aware of the concept of unintended costs. How much of our, how much tax money does the county get out of sales taxes? Here? In total, Dennis, do you want to give a specific figure? On local option sales tax, which is the only sales tax we actually get, our infrastructure gets around 450 to 500,000. Our secondary roads gets, which we use for tax relief, about well, a little over two million. Okay, two million dollars. Now think about this. You know what we're talking. I don't. You know you were raised here in Sioux City, and I watched you grow up. Uh, but you know little little counties, little little communities think a little different than we do, and. Those folks up in Sioux County have another market area that they can go to, and many of them do. And the ones that come down here just might not want to come down here anymore. You know, uh, some of these folks have real long, long thoughts on that. And just, you know, I'm, I'm not putting it out there it's going to happen, but I'm thinking, you know, there may be a number of them that just don't want to come down here and do business with us anymore. Uh, give that some thought when you vote. You know, how many tax dollars are we going to lose over time? because they feel like they have been really disrespected. Thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Gentlemen, um, I am not a citizen of Woodbury County. I have been with New Perspectives Incorporated here in Sioux City for 30 years. Yes, I started when I was 10. And um, I would just thank like to clarifying say... clarifying that, by the way. <laughs> I, was just, I was doing the math quickly, so thank you. You're welcome. Um, Thankfully, I do not have your job of trying to run a county. Um, however, uh, I have been a provider of services to people with disabilities for those 30 years. And when you um, speak of not being consulted, you know, um, regarding issues at the regional level, I think that all of the Woodbury County Sioux City providers feel the same way right now. Um, I mean, in the last two or three weeks, boom, all of a sudden, um, we're leaving the region um, as a provider that has been in the region since its inception, we have had nothing but positive interaction with all of the people from the region. And I feel that the Sioux Rivers region is very supportive to services and the people um, of all their counties. And it is a fear factor right now because we're jumping in to things that you don't know really what the services are that, that we can provide if we are 
part of the Rolling Hills or the southern region. Um, we don't, do we know what the levy is going to be? Is it going to be more? Is it going to be less? I mean, I think I realize there's a timeline, but if we could perhaps slow this process down just a little bit and get more information from the other uh, regions as to what we will be looking at as far as services, because in their 28E, you know, the region has to have the same services, blah, 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 you know. Um, and again, as far as um, the $90,000 annual grant from the Siouxland region, our community employment department, which currently has approximately 75 people in it, could not exist without the $90,000 grant right now because of the funding um, through uh, HCBS MCOs. So I, I guess our fear is that we as a county are jumping into something and we don't have all of the facts and I, that is what is very scary to most of us. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that perspective. It would be a new perspective, right? She didn't, yeah. you, you didn't give your name, it's Jolie Corder, Jolie. for the record. Thank you, Jolie. Hi. Nate Vanderplatz, 2214 South Maple, Sioux City. Um, I work over at, at Goodwill Industries with, with John and, and Gary here. Um, and over the last week, week and a half, I've been trying to figure out what this is about. What is it about? Is, is it about counties not getting along? Is it not, is it about there being a problem with the 2080. Is that a question you want to respond yeah, to? Am I on mark? Yeah, absolutely. And there's about 15 other things that we have issues with. Do you I'll want me to name this. them? It's not about the 2080. It is not about counties getting along. It is about the people you are here to serve. Period. If you can't get along with two other counties, that is not a problem for the people we serve. Now, the honest reality is the people we serve don't vote. Guess what that means? When you cut those services, and you will cut services, they're impacted. Not you. Very few other people in this room would be impacted. But you're tossing this around like it's a childish game around who's right and who's wrong and not about what's the right thing to do. That's what you need to focus on. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I, I would just respond to that. Um, the assumption predicated on you will cut services, and then we've also heard here are the services that are going to be cut, um, I think is, is premature. And I would also say this, having visited things like the Friendship House and the Crisis and Stabilization Center, I couldn't agree with you more. But I will tell you that part of what I'm fighting for is those services here in Woodbury County that I think are getting lost in the mix. But uh, any providers, do you feel that your services are being lost in the mix? <laughs> okay. Well, and I will tell you this as well. I have spoken to providers who, through a culture of what I would say is fear, don't speak. Uh, oh. I, again, if you have a culture of fear, not, not a single provider if you have... Okay, so if you have a culture of fear that it, for speaking yeah, out or for, <laughs> right, right, but by the very nature of not wanting to say this is what we fear, there's going to be repercussions for speaking out. Um, I think that that says a lot. Okay. Well, we'll go with the phantom providers. Well, you can characterize it as that and, um, and have that conjecture that you're right. I guess, uh, you know, one thing I'd point out that information, you know, an email that said was sent about the information I asked for, which was, you know, who we partner with, whether or not they're core, core plus, what dollar amount, that kind of information. Then to say I received the email, uh, the email that was resent was not that. It was just kind of like a checks payable the last year. What's interesting is uh, Goodwill was not listed at $90,000 provided to them. NPI was not listed at 90000 They were listed, but it was at $300,000. Uh, you know, the information we ask for, we never receive, and it's never accurate. We're told one thing and then told the exact opposite the next meeting. And, uh, you know, I, I think 
you know, to me, the, the solution is to find a, an organization that can be organized, and I think it'll be better for providers, it'll be better for taxpayers, it'll be better for everyone. The assumption that taxes are not going to go up on the mental health levy if we stay in Sioux Rivers is wrong. It's going to go up. It's guaranteed to go up. We've planned ahead for that. So, um, you know, I, I feel as though, as a board, we are trying to make the best decision for everybody in Woodbury County. Yes. Your question. Um, the Sioux Rivers region. Um, well, I remember we gave money for your building and construction. But well, I, no, that was not for our building and construction. Um, or vans. But that's okay. Um, but on an annual basis, the region votes to give, um, to spend so much money towards community employment. And that sum of money, and I didn't bring that information with me, um, it's, a, it's quite a bit of amount of money. Hope Haven oversees that. They pay out from, they oversee, they oversee the bookkeeping. So the checks, the majority of the, the money goes to Hope Haven. Hope Haven writes the checks for the marketing. They write the checks to NPI, to Goodwill, to Midst Ups for the grants. That's why it's not showing up because Hope Haven oversees that pot of money for the community employment enrichment. So again, the point I made though about not getting any information that's accurate is made. And Hope Haven, it shows $239,822. Uh, but down here it does list NPI at $300,883. Well, and that is probably um, could have been because neither one of you at the time when this was decided four years ago, um, were, were, you know, you were not aware that this is how it was run. Yes, it could be tightened up a little bit, but they're not not sending you the information on purpose. And you, you know, said they're not sending it, you mean not on purpose? Yeah. No, okay. Yeah. yeah, I got, I got what you're saying. Thank you. Yep. Yeah. So that's, that's one of the real problems. Mm -hmm. I think with this whole thing, <clears throat> when we set the levy, and I know it sounds like a small thing, you know, it, it can be characterized as you're not caring about people and you're, and that's fine, but it's not true. But when we get to the levy rate, that was set essentially before we even voted on it. What, what's the point as elected officials? Plymouth County went to equalize by a staff recommendation. They said, approve it retroactively. Okay. okay. Or you can increase your own levy. I asked for backup material to the Sioux City Community School District, a letter that, uh, two letters Dr. Gausman had received. Um, they didn't put that in. He said, it wasn't important. He said, I'll bring copies, I'll bring 75 copies so everybody can see that it was not. Uh, this board's funding decision that had anything to do uh, with their current uh, loss of an FTE. But I had to fight to get that out there, to get that information, because it wouldn't be included in the backup. I couldn't get on the agenda. You know, you, you, somebody brought up uh, supervisors, Clawson and Smith. We had disagreements. Not one time did it ever. And they can, if there was something, and Jackie or Larry, if you're listening, you can come and, and contradict me, but if I kept them off the agenda because I disagreed with something, never. Didn't always vote with them, but I always let them have their voice. It's not the same up there. You can't get on the agenda. Supervisor own couldn't get on the agenda. Our own agenda. It's not good governance. They know it, we know it. Other regions don't function like this. You get answers. You get an audit. The audit was, came back in March. None of my counterparts knew that an audit had been conducted. You know what the CEO said about the Sanford Center? I think this is actually, he said he didn't know there was money going there. Didn't know there was money going there. It was in the backup materials. 5% of your entire region budget of Sioux, Plymouth, and Woodbury County. I knew there's money going there. CEO didn't. Okay? I don't call that good managerial oversight. How was the CEO uh, evaluated? Anybody know? Yeah. And the uh, 
Regional Governance Board doesn't really know either. It's in the 2080 that it has to be followed. So those are some of the many issues. So, Mr. Rixner, unless, sir, if you don't mind, somebody who hasn't spoken, and then we'll come back to you if that's all right. Yes, sir. Good afternoon. My name is Carter Smith. I live over off of 17th Street. The last time I gave my personal address, my flowers were taken out twice in the same summer, so I'm not giving it today. Um, I wanted to speak on a few things. Um, the reason why I came here today was about transparency, about how our County Board of Supervisors is being run. And one of the areas of transparency that I had, a, and this is two parts, um, one of the areas of transparency that I had an issue with was the fact that we called for backup security at the last Board of Supervisors meeting, and then when questioned about it on the meeting, it was denied and had to be rebutted by county employees. So now, I think I will finish, and then you can counter, okay? But this, just but, a point of, no, excuse me. I am fine with this being brought up. Not in this particular discussion. If you want to bring it but up, it under has citizen, to do with this discussion. It, it really does not. Um, we are talking about whether or not this board is going to dissolve. And, and transparency is fine to bring up. It's fine to bring up at the beginning. It's fine to bring up at the end. But if you can just keep those comment, your comments right now to this, and then I will allow you all the time in the world. I'm not trying to, to, to stop you from the comments that I assume you will make. But if we can just focus them on this issue. All right. Well, I think it's important, important to speak about fear, Mr. Taylor. Thank you. Um, and the fact that sometimes people are afraid to speak up because of the actions that will come back at them in the long run, whether it's where they're employed at, how their yards are taken care of, who drives by. And I think the one thing to keep in mind with the Sanford Center and the groups that they work with is that they work with kids that are at risk. As someone who works in preventative health, I find that on the national level, it is often recommended that one of the most successful outcomes has to do with peer support. And that's not a licensed clinician. Um, with the staff at the Sanford Center and the programs being delivered, sometimes the best help that someone can get is someone that understands where they're coming from and ha can help point them in the direction of somewhere that's beneficial, such as Siouxland Mental Health or one of our other area agencies. I would hope that our Board of Supervisors would take a long, hard look at what's being done before we make rash decisions. You know, it's uncomfortable for me as a white male of privilege to be approached about the underlying racism that appear, appears to be present when a decision is being made. Um, Mr. DeWitt, from what I understand, it was either your father or your grandfather that kept a collection from World War II to remind us of what happens when we let things get out of control. And I think it's important when we look at the care that we're providing for our communities, a lot of the people that would Im be impacted by this decision do not have the means, resources, or time to be present to express their concerns or to deliver feedback on the services they are currently receiving. And it is short-sighted as a county if we do not take the time to do our research. There are a lot of questions that we do not have the answers to. And Mr. Taylor, I agree with you, there are a lot of hard decisions to make when it comes to taxes, levies, how things will be funded, and where cuts will be made. But I have felt from what I have read over the last few weeks and some of the behaviors that it is questionable how things are being done. And the reason why the initial point that I was making tied in to this topic about Sioux Rivers is, is because how funding is being made and what population is being served. And if we didn't have to call in security for the gun changes, the land changes, why did we have to call in extra security for the discussion on the Sanford Center and Sioux Rivers? And why that was it denied on a county board discussion and open conversation? And then our employees from the county had to we, discuss sir, we, how it was not true? We that will, is embarrassing. We will embarrassing. We will respond um, if you want to bring that up under citizen concerns so that we can keep the topic at hand. Oh, I think my topic's discussed. Okay, thank you very much. Anyone else who would like to hey, address Mr. Chair. Uh, yes, Mr. Ong. For the good of the public, I will respond to that either now or at the end, whatever you prefer. I, I prefer at the end so that we don't get into a back and forth exchange on what I assume will be a clarification of what happened and our sheriff is here as well and can clarify so that the um, 
charges of underlying racism that want to paint and color a topic, um, addressing mental health can be addressed at that time, if you don't mind. I don't mind. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Yes, um, if you would, Mr. Rixner, just someone who hasn't spoken before. Oh, I'm sorry. That's okay. You, know, you may not have seen. You don't have eyes in the I'm back of your head, neither do you. Okay. My name is Kathy Roberts. I am not a Woodbury County resident, but I am the manager of Friendship House, employed by Sula Mental Health Center. And I am terrified to stand here and say this, but I am one of those people who has told Jeremy that I'm afraid to speak up. And I want to give you an example. In August of 16, the Sioux Rivers Board was ready to approve building a new friendship house, which we desperately need. And I opposed the board simply for the location that it be put. And I'm no longer spoken to. I won't name names. I can't get emails to be returned to me. Heck, my um, previous supervisor even threatened to fire me in front of that board that day, which was embarrassing but he's a puppet on their string too. This is the big elephant in the room that nobody wants to talk about. Now we have jumped through all the hoops that Sioux Rivers has asked us to do. And on October 30th, we're gonna be going in front of the board to ask them for the money that they have approved for Friendship House. Not any new money, but just what has been approved. I really hope that Sioux Rivers will follow through with what they've approved. And I hope that uh, what I've had to say today won't impact that. But if it does, it'll be confirmation that Woodbury County is doing the right thing. Thank you very much. And thank you for the courage of those who would smile or deride or call it something that uh, doesn't exist. Clearly it does. Thank you. Mr. Rixner? Well, again, Jim Rixner, 114 Midville Avenue. Now, I, um, the reason I'm here is <clears throat> none of us enjoy beating a dead horse, okay? And we're not trying to beat a dead horse, but you've altered the, the, the nature of the discussion by action, on making an action to dissolve the region. So I don't think it's really redundant to go through some of this again, but I will be brief, okay? Number one, uh, I think it is accurate to say that in the history of the Sioux Rivers region that what has happened initially was the expansion of service and the reduction of the levy. I think that's a fair statement. Now, where we're at right now is a different discussion, and I understand that. Where we're going to be three years from now is another different discussion. I understand that as well. <clears throat> but I just want to repeat that services were expanded primarily through the Hope Haven operation for people with intellectual disabilities and the Crisis Stabilization Center at Woodbury County. They were expanded services that probably would not have come about were it not for the region. So for that, we should feel good about it. And the levy was slightly reduced, and as a taxpayer, I feel good about that. Okay? So it's not all black and white, and I just want to make that clear. Looking out into the future, what the state's going to do, what the federal government's going to do, what Woodbury County's going to do in relation to taxation and services, you know, we can all speculate upon, and I'm not here to do that. I just think that so far, so good. Now, decisions have been made to withdraw and probably dissolve uh, the region, and it may well happen. Here's my concern, and it's the reason I'm standing here today. When you all talk and everybody talks about the services at the Sanford Center and the services of the mental health center providing therapy in the schools, I'm the only person in this room that knows that history. I know it very well because it came out of the Safe School Healthy Student Program and we appealed for funding to Woodbury County and Woodbury County granted that money. Now, that's what happened, and I'm proud of that. You all have no idea how we have impacted when I was there and still today on the children in the schools. You have no idea how welcome we were by the principals, the teachers, the school counselors. 
You have no idea how many lives we probably saved by our therapists being there. In conjunction with the work of the Sanford Center, children's lives were made better, and the only real intervention and in prevention in mental health is early intervention. I've said this over and over again, and I do carry the initials behind my name and the experience. The sooner we can diagnose someone with a significant issue, the quicker we can help them and save them from a lifelong disability. For the last 10 years, I have proudly gone to Des Moines as a member of the Mental Health Planning Council and as a member of the Mental Health uh, Commission in some of those years, and said over and over and over again, all the counties in Iowa should be doing what Woodbury County is doing. We should be providing services in the school system. Yes, we all know, and Mr. Taylor, you were there in the basement of the Capitol when you were a representative, when we had the infamous discussion with Renee Schulte, several other uh, legislators, about whether Woodbury County could serve children or not. The conclusion was in the Iowa Code, we're not mandated to do that, but you could do it. So we did in Woodbury County, and it worked out very well. So much so, when the region was created, the services to children were grandfathered in, in relation Suddenly, Plymouth County has therapists in the schools, and then Sioux County had therapists in school. Fantastic. So it's one of the best things we've ever done in Woodbury County, reduced the number of kids, children in juveniles in detention, early intervention took place, kept children out of Eldora and Toledo, which were in bad places to send anyone. So my main concern in saying all this is real simple. I'm concerned that when we talk about services to juveniles, when we talk about reducing the Sanford Center's involvement, and we talk about anything else reducing the services to children, we're flying in the face of what has worked, and we're flying in the face of the new DHS director, Mr. Foxhaven, whose whole life has been child advocacy, and told us directly a month ago in Des Moines that he intends to build a children's system that we already have in place in Woodbury County and we'll be meeting with them again on Thursday. So I just want to be sure that we're clear about certain things. And the gentleman who spoke about peer support, I laud him, that was part of my discussion. We have people all over the state of Iowa who are not credentialed and licensed as mental health professionals. We could not function without those people because they're able to get people to trust the system, engage in the system, and fall through in the system because they've had a lived experience of a mental illness and it's research-based and evidence-based. So as we move forward, whatever region you all end up in, whatever you do, let's keep in front of us the eye on what we're supposed to do, which is help adults with disabilities and children with disabilities. And let's not bifurcate, as they say in legal jargon, children from adults. I think it's very, very important that we provide services to all ages. That's my reason for being here today. Thank you very much, Mr. Rexner. Any other board discussion uh, before uh, moving approval? Here. Sheriff Dave Drew, I have to leave at 6. I'm going to the meeting at the Museum Unity in the community, so I won't be here for the, the finale. Um, so if you had a question, I don't know if you can get to that now or not. but. I want to just kind of ask a question because I have concerns. Mm -hmm. One is, and these are selfish, so hang on. Um, we have worked for years to try to reduce our population in the jail. And uh, so in collaboration, we came up with this stabilization center, right? And it's there on whatever street that is on the north side. And uh, so we have, we have been able to... Um, keep officers from spending a lot of time in the ER. So I'm just hoping that we can somehow keep that going. And then lastly, uh, we have a very good employee who just started on this uh, jail alternative to help reduce our jail population, which I'm happy to report, running 234, 235 for the first few years I was in office down to sometimes 151, 161 because of collaboration with the public defender, county attorney's office, uh, the courts, and probation, and, and NIA. 
so we're starting to see some good results there, and I, I want to kind of, I don't want that to get lost in the sure. shuffle. And I, I think you're going to make sure that happens, but I don't know who owns that building, and I don't care. I just want to be able to have our officers from the PD, Sheriff's Office, Sergeant Bluff, if somebody's having a crisis, we can get them there and, and get them help. And then lastly, um, whatever the question about uh, Marty and Matthew and, and everybody, uh, what I told uh, Major Wick when we sat there on the side is that he needed to go up and correct that and just clarify that conversation that was handled. And uh, so I've watched the YouTube video, and I thought he explained what Matthew had asked, and, and uh, Matthew had asked for additional bodies. And uh, so in that uh, video, that's basically what it says. So I didn't see any point in continuing on. Mr. Chairman, may I respond? Sure. Sheriff, I'm very confused by what you just said. I have a text in front of me from Major Todd Wick that says this. I follow the sheriff's orders. We both think that everything has been clarified and you didn't ask for extra security. I want to make a brief comment uh, in response to Carter Smith. Well, just a minute. Uh, excuse me, please. I never requested extra security. The deputy never said I did. But some people who want to believe it, some people want to believe it, so they do. They can't comprehend or even entertain a situation where I did not have some nefarious motive in making sure adequate, which was the major's word, adequate, and normal security was present to ensure an orderly meeting. Why? Because sometimes I was told there are no deputies in the meeting, and I wanted to ensure that that was not the case when we had a contentious meeting coming up. Anything else is a despicable lie. It's race baiting and it's asinine. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <laughs> I, I think we're just splitting hairs. I think it's just uh, somebody's worried about things. This is what Major Wick had texted me. I was uh, on uh, Children's Miracle Network trip, and uh, so he said, hey, I just got off the phone with Matthew. He's asking that we attend the board meeting Tuesday. He thinks it will be contentious and, and wants us there if someone needs to be removed. All over... Taylor wanting to withdraw from Sioux Rivers Region Group and take the Sanford Center funding. That's for Major Wick. Now, I believe Major Wick. I believe Major Wick because he got up here and told the story. I think you see the video. I don't, I'm not here to split airs. I don't care. If, if you, you just said no, the problem was you did ask, and I think you're getting all caught up in worrying about if I ask for additional or um, because uh, whatever you just said about uh, um, additional security, I think you just mentioned that you're concerned that we're never here. I, I will tell you there, there have been very few times we're not here. So I, here's what I would like to do at this point. I believe that Supervisor Ung has shared his perspective that he was asking for adequate security because and you have said that you believe that it was stated um, otherwise. I don't want to, just as I, you know, to be fair and consistent to Mr. S yes. Smith. Yes. Thank you. To Mr. Smith, I don't want to uh, continue right, right. on. Um, we can, though, later on, but uh, Dr. Madison is patiently waiting. Right. And I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm just here to give my side yep. and what Major Wick said. Watch the video. That's what I'm saying. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Dr. Madison. Thank you. I'm Linda Madison, and I own property at 4623 Polk Street. Although since I've retired, I live in Mapleton and love it, by the way, which is from Mapleton. I've always been concerned about the well being of children. As you know, I was formerly associate superintendent of the school district. Children come first. I've always been an advocate for the children who cannot speak for themselves. They do not vote. 
they don't vote. Everything Jim Rexner said was right on target. I was also around when that Safe and Healthy Students grant was written. We now have had all kinds of social health, mental health workers in the schools. What's different about the Sanford Center is that these people save lives. They look like the children that they serve. So many mental health workers, Jim will tell you this, at Zulan Mental Health, look like you look and look like I look. It's hard for a child who is African American, Native American, Hispanic American to trust us. It is. It takes longer. The people at the Sanford Center get into the homes, work with the families. They provide a service that others cannot provide, at least not as quickly. So I hope you realize that your two most top priorities are, first of all, public safety. Secondly, mental health. Down the road come bridges and roads. People come first. Think about the children and do what's right here. Make sure that if you make a change, you don't impact mental health. It will impact this community down the road. You've seen Las Vegas, you've seen other places. Mental health must not be cut. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Madison. Two people from my yesteryears in education or in schooling, so good to see you. All right, I believe that we've had over almost an hour of, of public input and board dialogue. Um, at this point, I'd, I'd move to have the Woodbury County Board of Supervisor liaisons to the governing board move at the next governing board meeting at the Sioux Rivers Regional MHDS dissolve and terminate. And we'll look for a second. I'll second it. There's been a motion and a second. Is there any other discussion? Who's second? Uh, Keith, me. Keith. Mr. Adig. Uh, will the auditor please call the roll? DeWitt? Aye. Potterbaum? No. <clears throat> Reddick? Aye. Taylor? Aye. Oh. Aye. And the motion carries four to one. Uh, we will report back from uh, either one of the regions or I should say in both. Um, should discussions continue forward and give updates as we do with our liaisons. Thank you very much for the respectful discussion. Item number eight is our conservation director, Rick Schneider. This is a presentation and approval of the conservation annual report. I'm sorry to say that this will, unless you're changing your mind, I most likely be your last. Weeks ago. <laughs> okay. Well, we're, uh, we're still holding out hope, um, but. Rick Snyder, uh, conservation director for eight more weeks. <laughs> <laughs> but who's counting, right, Rick? No, I'm not counting. Uh, I have before you the uh, uh, fiscal of uh, 17 annual report of the Conservation Department. Uh, I just point out a few things on the executive summary page. Our highlights for the year, we started out a year ago in July, at the start of the fiscal year, opening our two new camping cabins at Southwood Conservation Area. During the year, we finished expanding Curtin Timber by 120 acres. We uh, added a, a nice little uh, river access on the Little Sioux River by uh, the D50 Bridge uh, south of Anthon. That was DOT property that they allow us to manage now. And we uh, installed a water control structure at Little Sioux Park Lake uh, this past spring in anticipation of some of the beach renovation work that we just started this week and will finish up next spring. Um, first of the year, we moved all our cabin and shelter rental reservations to uh, the online system. Uh, that's, that's worked out very well. One of our uh, employees has a little bit more work to do with that and, and uh, balancing all that stuff, but it, it's worked out quite well. So that's uh, pretty much where we're at on uh, for our fiscal year. And uh, be happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you very much. Questions for Director Snyder. With the online system, have you noticed an uptick or uh, a way to measurably see if you've had... I haven't 
taken a close look at that yet. We'll have our uh, year-end reports um, in another six weeks or so. I, I'm thinking there is. I'm okay. There is. It, it seems that way to me that the reservations are up. Okay, great. And then the other thing, and this is a dangerous thing for me to bring up because it may lead to a funding request, but how is the, the whole situation with the Nature Center as far as uh, cable, uh, Internet access? I'm not using the right term. Not good. Okay. <laughs> not good. Well, that's all I wanted to know. Thank you very much for your time. <laughs> okay, so is that something that in the future we'll, we'll look at as... We're looking I, for... Uh, for solutions, uh, we've had different groups out there to look. Uh, they want to put towers up on the property. We can't do that in a state park, so we can get wireless. You know, we're back into trying to get fiber out there, probably. Um, I'm, I'm willing to work with any other group that wants to put it in and split costs or something if they want to uh, be able to sell access off that line or something. Um, we know about what it would cost. We could uh, we could hire somebody to put it in and buy materials ourselves. We've looked at that, um, but it, you know it's a hundred thousand dollar bill to get it out there. So I think we'd be willing to split it with the supervisors if you <laughs> help us get good access out there. It's terrible. Absolutely. We'll talk about it when you're gone. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Because I won't be I won't be the recipient of it anyway or the beneficiary. Mm. All right, other questions or, or thoughts? Well, I just want to say thank you. Uh, this is, I think, the outstanding uh, conservation uh, program and system in the state, and I think it uh, has a lot to do with your leadership and I've always been a so Thank you very much. Great staff, great board. I appreciate your support, too. That's where it comes from. So. Thanks. Sir. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. All right, I will move to receive the Woodbury County Conservation Board July 1st, uh, 2016 to June 30th, 2017 report. Second. The motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say no. And the motion carries 5 to 0. Item 9, Human Resources, Director Ed Gilliland. Uh, a is approval of the Delta Dental Renewal. So uh, Delta Dental Renewal is a pretty standard thing. It's, uh, it goes up about 3% a year. That's what they do across their line of business. It impacts the county by about uh, $650 a year. Uh, our claims are down a little bit this year compared to last year. So it doesn't look like we're going to have to change our rates. Um, they seem to provide great service and year in and year out is the best pricing. Thank you very much. I'll move it. Second. A motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 We'll say no. And a motion carries five to zero. Item B is acceptance of the GAB 75 report. It sounds like a firearm, but go ahead, Ed. Yes. Uh, this is just uh, more fun than you can stand. But, uh, GASB, I should have said. It says GAB. The thing. Government Accounting Standards Board 75 report that uh, tells us about uh, obligations that we have, liabilities for potential uh, employee benefits for retirees, that type of thing. Uh, we engaged, previously we had engaged a, a firm that was uh, recommended by ISAC, uh, kind of endorsed by them. Uh, we went out and sought a different firm this year, uh, one that utilized some pretty sophisticated actuaries. Um, you pair the calculations that they made and the, and the diligence that they did with work as well as a little bit higher interest rate now than we had in the past, and it's uh, helped reduce our OPEB liabilities dramatically. Uh, and, and a lot of it was the questioning and the different pieces that they had, uh, thanks to Michelle and, and some others. We were able to really gather a tremendous amount of data, and uh, our uh, OPEB reserves uh, went, will go from 5.293778 million and um, they will drop to 3.538394 million. So, so to somebody whose mind is trying to catch up, what does this mean as far as the fiscal impact to the county? Well, as far as fiscal impact to the county, it means that we have to set 1.7 million less aside in reserves. It frees up that money for other things. Like fiber. To the, uh, <laughs> that's that's out of my league. I don't know. <laughs> but but are you saying that there's now 
that amount of dollars that will be on an annual basis less expended? But with said, what it is is it, it's, what OPEB does is you have to set aside in reserves the money uh, to cover these potential liabilities, potential employee benefits liabilities. Uh, and uh, what this does, it just means that you have to have less reserves. Uh, so there, it does free up initially some money. Dennis. Thank you very much, Ed. That was a good explanation. Dennis? This is very sim or similar to what we have to do for the GASB reports, where we have to set aside a pension liability also. The odds of these ever being paid out are pretty much nil, none. And we you know, we use this when we go through the district health accrued fund balance. It shows they may be in negative, but that's because you have to add these back, these items back in, subtract the inflows, it comes back to positive balance. But the odds of these ever being paid out is probably zero. But this isn't like there's a check somewhere. No. It's not money available to spend. Hey, I've learned anything that starts with Gasby, I start to shake. <laughs> All right, well, I would move to accept the Gasby 75 report. Sorry. There's a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed say no. And the motion carries five to zero. But Keith Raddick down there is going to say his daughter was reading the Great Gatsby. But item ten, emergency services with Director Gary Brown. A is consideration and approval to allow vacation leave donation between Woodbury County Information and Communication Commission and Woodbury County employees. Gary. Good afternoon. Um, our WCICC employees, which is the Information Technology side, and the nine one one operators actually a separate group of uh, employees. They're employed by both the county and the city. Their paychecks and their benefits all come through the city of Sioux City. Um, I think on the IT side, we pay about 45% of their budget. And on the information, the communication center side, it's about 30%. I think it's coming over the phone. That screeching noise. Yeah, it sounds like Matthew's either sawing some logs in the background or he's carving his initials in the teeth pen, or something that he's sitting on. I think. So, um, in the last couple of years, right. we've had two of our two of our telecommunicators. Um, one had a catastrophic illness with a family member, and now we've got a young man that's got a catastrophic illness, and he's got four family, uh, four children plus a wife. And we all in public safety world work real well together, and we really become kind of a big family. And it, the last time we wanted to do this, it was just kind of a sudden stop, no, and we didn't get much farther. And then when, uh, when this other employee's medical condition arose, um, we all started talking about it, and, and we would like to see if we could do something to allow county employees to donate. Right now, city employees can donate vacation leave to city employees. County employees can donate sick time to each other. And what we're advocating is, uh, because there are city employees, that the county employees be allowed to donate sick time, just like he would receive from his comrades on the city side. Um, he's been off work for several weeks now, and he does make, I mean, 911 operators don't make a lot of money. And, you know, the bills are piling up. They've, they've done some donation for him on the city side of vacation time. We actually have a fundraiser coming up. Um, to try to help the family out, Erica and the operators at uh, the comm center have just just about busted themselves in half trying to get this fundraiser put together. It's Thursday, October 19th from 5 to 7 at the Sergeant Bluff Fire Station. You guys can have these to write down the date if you want. Uh, Olive Garden is providing the food. SAFE is, is helping organize it. But um, we really feel like these people are a part of us. Because well, you know, they, they serve the sheriff's department, they serve the jail, they serve my department, they serve all the volunteer fire and EMS people, and we would just like to get a system in place. John Malloy's in favor of it, Glenn Sedefi's in favor of it, Wendy's in favor of it. Uh, I talked to Ed, and Ed gave me some parameters at least to get out the starting gate with. I met with Pat, and um, he's been doing a lot of research on it. Uh, because there are some legalities to it, and there's issues with payroll, and there's issues with taxes, and and I told Pat before this meeting I was going to get this far and then I'm going to punt so Pat can kind of fill you in on the legalities and the, and the ramifications of doing it. Can we just sort out the legalities and vote on it? 
Because I'm, like I'm, I'm all for it, and I can't imagine anyone not being. But I like Gary to do all the hard work, but the sheriff's office would be loving to be if we go with this to go forward and be part of this also. I do, I do have a question though. Uh, Thank you. Say if somebody were, uh, you know, somebody that worked at the jail as a county employee, uh, is the city able to donate if they were to need something in the future? Because no. that might be nice to right. maybe approach the council now as well since i think we're all in favor of doing this uh i, I look at the you know kind of working with this i appreciate your thought too but the wcicc employees they're both of ours sure absolutely they're both of ours and they're they're not they don't necessarily get a lot of exposure to the rest of the workforce i mean the it department gets seen around the courthouse and city hall on a regular basis and the communication center operators we talk to them over the radio talk to them on the phone but we rarely see them but they are, they're our first line of defense, and they're the ones that keep our, you know, Marty, they're the ones that keep you from, they're the ones that help you go home at the end of the shift, so. So thank you very much for those opening comments and from the sheriff's office. I'd like to see if the uh, auditor is going to receive the punt okay. and uh, fair catch or run with it. Uh, Gary brought this to me, and, and we have done, uh, a lot of uh, research on it. Uh, uh, the legalities is that uh, they are not uh, not county employees, uh, and we do pay for them through a 2080 agreement. We contribute to their uh, to their uh, uh, the appropriation that we made to uh, uh, WCICC in the dispatch, but they are not uh, county employees. They are city employees. And so that presents a lot of challenges for us. And one of the things that, uh, that we did the research is that uh, in three, uh, three of your contracts right now, it uh, must be a subject of bargaining because three contracts uh, expressly say that uh, county, uh, you will not pay out uh, vacation benefits uh, to county employees. And that's what you would have to do in order, to, in order for this to happen. Because we can't, uh, uh, we can't do that. There's no process for us to give that money to uh, the city employees. The way it works over the city is that they uh, donate uh, a vacation. They can donate vacation to other city employees. But the when they do that, it goes to the from the donor to the donee, and the donee pays the taxes on it. Okay, so. Here, uh, because they're not employees, we can't transfer that. Uh, there is not a way to do that, uh, to give that money to the city. Uh, and those employees that, are, uh, that would want to do it, the county employees who would want to do it, uh, we would have to take, they would donate hours, we would convert that to cash, and then we would take taxes out of that. And then we have to come up with a way to uh, write a check to the donee. Okay. Uh, one of the things I'm just going to suggest is that you talk to your attorney who does the bargaining for you to, uh, so that you have a good understanding of why it's in the contracts the way it is now, is that uh, it's not allowed in uh, three contracts that we looked at. So uh, there'd be a way probably, you know, if we come through the policy committee that uh, you could look at that. And I've always told the Board of Supervisors, if you have three votes, you can do anything you want. Um, that's the way that process works. But, but it is in the contracts now that you, that you can't pay that out. So if that, just to clarify, just so I'm, but because it's in the contracts right now, uh, even by a majority vote, we couldn't amend those contracts. You'd have because to check are, with the attorney okay. about that. I did visit with the, uh, or Wendy visited with the attorney for the, uh, labor representative for the communications operators, and he's absolutely fine with it. And I think he would help champion the cause of the other unions if we needed that. But it sounds like we need to have that. Yeah, because that's what it, that's what it is. It's a payout of uh, vacation money. Right now, the county uh, carries about four to 500,000, I think, in liability for uh, the accrued benefits of, uh, of uh, vacation. And once you pay that out, it's actually, it's a small amount, and it's not going to occur very often. But, it's, uh, but it still will cost the county uh, 
you have to pay the share of the taxes. Um, the uh, the uh, donor would pay taxes, and the county has to pay a share of that too. So there, I mean, it gets complicated, a lot of things. It doesn't happen very often, and uh, if it comes through the policy committee, you can do that. You have to check with all the... Uh, the attorneys on those things, but but it's not an easy it's not an easy uh, step. Supervisor, thank you. So in essence, we can't do it. Nobody's opposed to doing it, but probably for the moment, the best thing to do is just make a personal donation. Everybody's been doing that as well, but I mean, this kind of sends a different message when you when you're willing to give up a day off for your coworker. I mean, I think that's the message that we want to send to the families, a great family. So we can. In, in some fashion, at least blame lawyers that we can't do this. Well, I don't think Pat's well, what's, we when's can. the uh, when's the contract take like an negotiate? addendum? Each of the unions could sign an addendum. That's, and my, that's my point. Is it's, it's that's a easy. Volunteer for each union member. You're not forcing the union to do something, so they're not going to have a grievance with it because we would just ask the members who wants to do this and whoever voluntarily comes forward to donate eight, sixteen hours, whatever they're going to donate. Then you like what Pat said. Then it's okay. You take that out the books. You turn it into cash. You take the taxes out, and that cash goes to to right. the individual. Right. So I don't. And having some dealings with being the past union president, I don't see a grievance or a problem with our contracts because you're going to be asking for volunteers. It's somebody's going to volunteer. So yeah, I'll give you 16 hours. You know. I think you'd still need to just. A one-page addendum to each contract that we've agreed to allow. That's correct. Right. Yes, and that would be simple. We won't. Yeah. Or take our policy and attach it to their. Okay, so we won't do something in violation of a contract. Right. Yeah, you know, right. 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 No, we want to do this right. We, yeah. Right. So here's my question. This sounds great. It sounds like everybody's. Who's holding the ball now to keep our football analogy, and who will contact, um, class law firm. And That'd be up to Ed to do that, to HR. To so I, I think that if you can, if HR can reach out to class law firm and say that there's the general, this is all right, consensus of the board to want to know what the mechanics and the means of accomplishing this would be um, per a one-page addendum to the contracts, how do we get her done? It's, uh, and I think it would be appropriate just to take it through the policy review committee. And then once that information is found at a policy review committee, I think we'll all get there and appreciate the idea being brought up. Anything I, else you want to add on? Well, I provided the, we got a city's donation policy, and Ed has that, and then he and I have talked, and he, I think he may have already started drafting a, a draft policy to take, because I think there's a policy review committee in November. Coming up, I think is what Ed told me there was going to be one in November. So, okay. Well, let's follow up on that, and we'll uh, go from there. We appreciate you bringing it in front of our attention. Yeah, because um, without without the support of the board, we really couldn't take it any farther. We're right. looking for that nod from the board that says, "Okay, guys, keep." All right. Away. Sounds good. Let's talk uh, paramedics. So the next item is emergency services to hire two full-time operations officers, paramedics, and one three. One and three quarters, um, part-time operations officer paramedic by January second. A total of two point or two and three quarters position. Thank you. I don't know if that's stated clear up there or not, but um, since 1982, our department, and matter of fact, the region has had a very good working relationship with Siouxland paramedics. Um, Top-notch group of people that deliver extremely good patient care. Um, they, in the past, what they do is they do what's called a tiered response or a paramedic assist with us in the rural area. So they, um, the volunteer squad gets the call. Based on the information, either the dispatch is able to tell us or when we arrive on the scene, the condition of the patient, that's when we start to tear up. And that could be um, some paramedics, that could be uh, Mercy Air Care, that could be a, a squad from another county that maybe has some specialty services. But that tier takes place. And what we're out to do is try to deliver the best possible care uh, in the field of the patient and increase their survivability. We moved out to Climbing Hill a little over 20 years ago, and we've been responding for, on behalf of the county as a tiered response group um, from Climbing Hill. The nice part about the Climbing Hill location is generally we're moving towards them at the same time they're moving towards us. 
Uh, a lot of the calls, uh, Woodbury County's a big county. It's, it's a long way across and it's a long way deep. The squads that probably don't get the greatest advantage of us uh, with the tiered response right now are Lawton and Sergeant Bluff and the Sailors because they tend to get on the scene and they've got resources, they've got their own paramedics, and they tend to be moving along. However, we do go in with them several times a month uh, when they're short staff or when they don't have a paramedic available. Right now we have a paramedic on Monday through Friday, one week, 7 a.m. to 7 p.m., and the, the second week, 7 a.m., to 7 p.m. Monday through Friday, or Monday through Thursday. So every other Friday after 7 o'clock at night and weekends, we don't have any paramedic level coverage. Um, there are a few paramedics in the county, primarily over in that northwest corner. We do call when we need it for a paramedic assist from Siouxland. Part of the problem with Siouxland is they've come, become just extremely busy. And they don't like it when they can't, can't honor a tier request, um, but they become really busy. And it's, it's hard for them to break a crew loose. For the last two or three years, we've been talking with the board, and you gave me a position three years ago in my budget asking, and we put him on strictly on days, that 7 to 7, because that's when Siouxland Paramedics was the busiest, and we were having the most trouble getting paramedic assists from that shop. So we, we plugged that hole first uh, the best we could with one guy. The way we're set up now with our system is 7 to 7, and there's two guys on, uh, we go to the call, we're automatically dispatched, we go to the call, we get there, we determine based on the condition of the patient who needs to go. Uh, just to give you an example, we had uh, two calls go down at the same time, we had a lift assist in Anthem, we had a trouble breathing in nurse in Cretchenville. The frontline squad, the first squad out the door started for Anthem, they were about three miles away from Climbing Hill, the second call come in for trouble breathing, I then dispatched to go to Anthem and pulled the paramedic and sent him and the other guy to the trouble breathing call in Cretchenville. So we move our resources back and forth around all the time. If there are two of them on together and they go to a call and a paramedic's not needed, the paramedic stays with the squad. The basic EMT goes in with the patient to the hospital and then generally speaking what we do is like if it's a Cushing or a Mobile call, we just hang out at Mobile on Highway 20 and pick our partner up on the way back. So we're not driving all the way to the hospital we're not just hanging out in Cushing, we're going back to a central location in the county that makes us available for the next call. There are literally days where we'll have uh, the duty shift coming off, we'll be out on a call. A lot of our calls come in between 6 and 8. Uh, the guys coming on duty will be on a call. We'll split that team to two calls, and on my way to work I pick up a, a fourth call. So there's times that um, one paramedic or one team it falls way short of the need. There's 12 transporting ambulances in rural Woodbury County, two first response services, and uh, three counting us. There's Mercy Air Care that we use. We use them a lot whenever it's appropriate to use them. They're, they're an incredible service, but they, they have limits with weather and, and landing zones and that kind of stuff. Um, but the idea would be to put full-time, two-man squad, and that's for a safety reason as well. It's not safe right now in this day and age uh, for one person to be going in and out of people's houses in the middle of the nights and, and in some of these residences we go in and out of, um, we're not armed uh, and we're a lot of times there before anybody else is. And even with the extrication scenes and stuff like that, it's, it's hard to do extrication by yourself, it's hard to do CPR by yourself. It's just not, you just, it's not a good situation. Our volunteer squads do great. We get, uh, uh, we've, I think we've been able to sustain what we've been doing now for better than 10 years because of the relationship that we have. In Iowa, no one, and you've seen a big push in eastern Iowa, if you're looking at any of the eastern Iowa uh, media right now, uh, there's a big push in eastern Iowa to try to make EMS an essential service. And I'll translate that for you. It's the County Board of Supervisors pays for it. That's what EMS becoming an essential service is because there's nobody else. No one is required by law to provide EMS. Townships may. They're mandated for fire protection. Cities don't have to provide ambulance. Counties don't have to provide ambulance. The state of Iowa doesn't have to provide ambulance. The city of Sioux City, uh, January 1st, will go to their own ambulance service. I've talked extensively with Chief Everett. Uh, we have a great working relationship, and he has assured me that the resources they're putting together to meet the city's needs, and I can't blame him. The city taxpayers are going to pay for it. 
However, he's also committed, as well as my other counterparts across the region, that in the event of a mass casualty situation or something really bad happening, we, we're going to go where the need is at as a force to, to, to stop the dying and get people to the hospital. Um, Siouxland paramedics, uh, last I knew, which was uh, Friday of last week, they intend to come back as a transfer transport ambulance service. They've said, hey, if we've got a crew available, we'll be more than happy to help you out, but they lose money on every 911 call, but they're definitely going to be willing to help us out, and there'll be times when all of our resources get consumed. Burgess and Ottawa's got paramedics. A lot of times we'll, we'll let, lean on them from the south. Ida Grove has just started up a nurse paramedic exception program for their transfers coming through Woodbury County, so they've got ALS on board. Their ambulances when they're bringing them to Sioux City, because that used to be a problem. They'd get about halfway through Woodbury County and something bad happened. Lamar's has got paramedics. Um, North Sioux, right now they don't know what they're going to do in Union County. I talked to the fire chief over there uh, yesterday afternoon, and they have no idea what they're going to do. Uh, South Sioux is gearing up to staff their own ambulance service. They've got two rigs. Are, are any of these going to impact us? Pardon? Are any of these going to impact us, potentially? No. Okay. No. Everybody, so, well, quite, quite honestly, everybody's trying to maintain a level of service to their citizenry. Sure. Uh, so with that, um, and... I like to err on the side of more rather than less, so both this and your opening comments have been very, very good. Um, questions, discussion, thoughts? The only thing I would just add quickly is we're coming in, I'd like to do this in the middle of a budget year. It's a $100,000 impact. I'd like to get the program rolling by the 1st of January. It's a $200,000 impact on every budget thereafter. It probably just as goes over 200 by the time we <coughs> get the extra drugs and the medications and the uniforms and stuff that two and a half more people or two and three quarter more people. It's not going to be a lot, but it's it's going to be right at a $200,000 a year ticket. We bill the services 200 bucks. If they collect, we collect. But if we, turn, if we start doing the transporting and we take all the billing, all of these volunteer services are going to go away. They won't have the money to operate. And then we couldn't put enough ambulances out on the street to cover this county. We need to do everything we can to keep those volunteer squads alive and as healthy as possible for as long as possible. So one of the reasons, uh, just uh, really quickly, and then I'll uh, call in the supervisor. Uh, one of the reasons that I wanted this to become informational was that uh, I think it uh, just lended itself to having the discussion, especially since it's in the middle of the year, that some of the funding mechanisms we can talk about. Um, so it, that's one thing. Yes, Supervisor Ong. A uh, question for Gary. When you and I talked about potential use of a portion of the EMS loan fund, uh, my impression was that would be a deduction, but in the agenda item you uh, are talking about a two-and-a-half-year payback term. I'm just not sure that makes sense for the county to maintain a, a loan fund and then borrow from that loan fund. Do you know what I mean? Correct. As you and I talked about, uh, Supervisor, on that – the EMS Association, while it's the county's money, the EMS Association is the beneficiary of it. And um, as I indicated to you, I, would, I wanted to meet with them before uh, we went any farther with this. And it was out of that meeting, the, the association members felt that by depleting the fund by 50000 and not having some opportunity to put that back, uh, they all feel the EMS loan fund has been probably one of the best things, if not the best thing, ever put in place in Woodbury County for EMS. It's given us the ability to buy rigs and equipment, not have to pay interest. We're not using pancake fundraiser money to pay interest. Um, and then further visiting with Danny Butler, uh, Danny brought it to my attention that the, uh, the rules of the EMS loan fund actually don't, the rules that were set up for it, actually don't allow it to be used for personnel costs. And I don't know if you want to speak any more to that, Denny, or not. Yeah, I want to say a couple things there. First, the EMS loan fund is controlled by the Board of Supervisors, not by EMS Association. That's controlled by the Board. Second, the EMS loan fund, since I believe 1988, when established, has always been used for equipment. No personnel. We're varying from the intent and the purpose of the EMS loan fund. Third, I have checked with the city finance director and they will be requesting the 40,000 that was set aside for the SPI because in the situation with Sioux and paramedics they are in a little bit of a problem and we did agree during budget time that we'd use that money to help them offset that so that money will not be available 
So the recommendation or suggestion, I would say that we maybe look at other funds, such as gaming revenues, for the first six months of funding of this, if the board does approve this. Second, we will approve this during the budget hearing if the board wants to budget for next year. Like Gary said, there will be a $200,000 increase in expenses. But for the six months from January 1st to June 30th, we need to look at other funds. So basically all how the... Many... Go ahead, Supervisor Home. I was going to ask how many dollars are currently idle in this uh, loan fund? About 165000 no, about 100, 185, about 145. How much do we have in reserves, Dennis? In which fund? The county's big bank. The county, um, in the general basic fund, we're not in too bad a shape because we're trying to rebuild them. General supplemental, there's not a whole lot of reserves there to use. In gaming revenues, we got a little over 200,000 available that's unallocated. In the big bank, in the big reserves? Mm -hmm. In our 20 percent oh we're trying to get back to the 20 percent a goal was 22 percent so really we're trying to rebuild them to get back to that 22 percent all of these are great extraneous pieces of information but just how much generally speaking dollar wise million ten million oh grand total for all the funds right, right. about 10 11 million okay so I, my whole point in this is just I don't know if it makes sense to start mixing apples and oranges with personnel costs and going into a $165,000 fund that we'll repay within two years. I just think it muddles everything up. Okay. We could either do it through a budget amendment, we could do it through gaming, but I don't, I don't. Right. But the one question there then, if we use this loan fund to use it, where is the county going to get the money back to pay them back? R right, right, which is why I, this whole loan thing. That, doesn't want to use the loan. Yeah, I don't want to use the loan. Correct. And, you, you know, I guess... In, in, if we do it, let's do it. If we're not going to do it, let's not. It says a lot to the EMS Association's desire to have this happen because they want the loan fund, but they need this too, and that's all they were asking. And, sure. the, and, the, and the vote was unanimous, too. Yeah. There was no dissension. I'd almost r rather borrow the money from ourselves and pay whatever nickels. That it, you know, yeah, I mean, to me, it just muddies the waters. Probably the best way is to amend our budget through our budget process for the board approving the hiring of the two and three quarters, whatever people, and pay it out of cash reserves. Yeah. I don't have any problem with the first six months. What, it, what it's after that saying? that I'm just trying to make sure, because we're almost making a budget decision for FY19. That's my heartburn. Correct. Right? So I'm cool with the six months, but then I don't want to turn around after those six months and say, hey, we didn't think about further, and we're making that decision into perpetuity, right? Because, you know, once you hire somebody, so that's the other reason why I wanted to hit the pause button and just think. Did you have something super? Yeah, if we're going to pay the city the forty thousand. Are they going to maintain the services the way SPI did? No, this is basically to help them through their situation they are now in. Um, there's the next number of dollar amount that they are kind of in the hole, and we did agree to help them help the city fund this. We didn't, we didn't use it last year, so we carried last year and added some money to it, and I think it's right around 40000 but they are going to request that money this fiscal year. In the background of that $40,000 by helping city, the city of Sioux City with the subsidy is we were using Sioux Land, and we weren't putting anything into it, and the city of Sioux City owned Sioux Land, but that didn't own the company, but owned all the equipment, owned all the resources, was subsidizing the service, and we're good neighbors. We were just... Hey, thank you, and we weren't putting anything into the pot, so that 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 pot of money was set aside to offset some of the use that we get out of Siouxland permit. So all these, the forty thousand, the ten thousand, the all those just need to go away as far as uh, we're being asked for two hundred thousand, and to add two point seven five FTEs. Correct. And that request should come during the budget cycle for fifth for nineteen. Right. And the real concern is what you're expressing. Let's worry about the six months now to get us to that Well, point. yeah, except once we do that, That's uh, it. unless you're going to turn around and have a serious discussion about laying people off, which I don't want to do. No. So if we start down the tracks, 
the train's going to keep going. You're right. The continuation will be part of the budget process. Correct. I mean, that's because you're not going to hire them for six months. No. You know, we've been here, I think, three years, you know, working up to this, hoping we could bring it in slow over time. And we appreciate the fact that the board gave us one full-time paramedic. And last year we challenged you for two more, and we didn't get them. But we asked you to, to bring our wages up a little bit for our mm -hmm. paramedics, and you did that. That that in itself is going to make a significant difference, and we thank you for that, because we're going to be competing with several services now to try to hire those same people. So um, that helped. That was good timing-wise to, to bump those salaries up a little bit. So, Can I ask you three questions? Has Siouxland Paramedics been asked, or I think I maybe had Dennis reach out and, uh, and make a call, on doing some sort of contractual thing? I know that's not what you're asking. You're asking for the the FTEs, but have they been approached even to say, here's what we could do, and then we'd look at that and say, well, that's not as good as bringing on people? I did call them last Thursday or Friday. They were supposed to get back to me. I called Mr. Welty, and he was going to talk to his superiors. I did not hear back, so they did not intend to, but he's going to see if they're interested. did not get a call, so I'm assuming they aren't interested. I can give you a little background on that. There was a reach out from the City of Sioux City Council to try to give the city some breathing room to get an RFP on the street for an, a contract ambulance. They were offered, I think, $50,000 a month for the next six months and even $650,000 for the next six months just to give the city some breathing room to put an RFP out, and they declined all of them. We're fortunate. We, we really want Siouxland to stay in business because they also serve as our, our medical examiner's office, taking cases from the scene to the mortuary where autopsies are done. And then they also have a relationship with the jail on uh, non-emergency transfers from prisoners uh, to and from the jail. So um, if we don't have Siouxland doing those, then that's going to be an emergency at the emergency rate done by either Sioux City Fire Department or somebody else. So, so my follow-on is uh, I'd like, and however you all tag team this, I don't want to assume because they're really busy. I just I want to at least have done the due diligence to say they came back and they said it's going to cost you 400000 a year. And we say, well, $200,000 a year isn't looking so bad. Or it was one C, or whatever it is. I just at least like to be able to cross that off without just, you know, crossing it off because we right. haven't explored it. Well, what you, and the other thing, if we're going to do that, really you need to say, what do you want? What do we want from them? You know, because do we want six people... Are two people 24-7, you know, plus fill-in time? Uh, we multitask the employees that we have. We do animal patrol, we do fire calls, we do rescue, we do uh, rural addressing, we help the sheriff's department out. We actually are kind of more of a public safety officer. If we've got cattle out and they're out of position, we'll go out and help them, you know. Mm -hmm. So... But at least to be able to look at it and to say, let's just say it was, uh, uh, like my mom would say, a worse. If it was 200000 and 200000 and they said, well, we would be able to staff people that would. I, I just want right. to make sure in my, I'm not up at night. Put an employee in Siouxland paramed uh, Paramedics out there a four-door sedan run on paramedic level of calls isn't apples to apples to what we are doing. And it, and it doesn't increase the safety factor in it. We've got the redundancy, actually. Our redundancy is very good. Some of the changes we've made the last three or four years have been good for the department, good for the county. So, But I'll leave that to Dennis to... Okay. He's initiated that, so... I appreciate it, and then... Um, if you would let me know what you hear, if there's any further conversations with me. Call twice a day until the answer. And then the other thing is, what would happen if only two were brought on instead of 2.75? And then my following question to that is, and this may sound like a dumb question, but I'm the one who asks them, what will happen if somebody's just not there? Is that a dumb question? The sheriff's department's a lot of times going to be out there doing CPR by themselves. Okay. Or the ambulance service. Will do as much as they can, but they may not be able to administer the higher level drugs that a paramedic would. Is that? They don't have the drugs. They don't have the techniques. They don't have the advanced airways. They can't do... When you get into a critical situation, and believe it or not, one of the things we do more than anything else is pain management. You've got an 86-year-old lady with a broken hip. She's got an hour-long ride to the hospital. If you don't give her some pain management, which only the paramedics can do, you could kill her before you get her to the hospital. She could literally have a heart attack or a stroke from the pain, the intense pain of that hip being broke. 
So. And we have heard in our early meetings about uh, the, this need. What happens if you go from 2.75 to 2? Well, the problem is I would drop from paramedic coverage at some point because we, we work under a, what's called the Fair Labor Standards Act's 207K plan. So we can work our guys 212 hours in a 28-day cycle before we have to give them comp time or overtime. And every cycle we end up with about 45 hours, 50 hours, depending on which cycle it is, that we have to have somebody else to cover. Or we don't have anybody in that slot. Or we, we're going to pay a mountain of overtime. And the three-quarter time position will, will pay, pay you back in space just by not paying overtime unless you want to leave the shop empty, the, that position vacant during that period of time. Now how long would that period of time be? It would be about, uh, without that three-quarter time position, somewhere around 50 hours a week. And without someone being reliable to call upon. The nice part, I mean, the other thing we do with this three-quarter time position is we also use that as a, the next guy that probably wants a full-time job is sitting in that seat. Mm -hmm. We want to try to hire personnel from Woodbury County if at all possible, or we don't have a hiring restriction with Woodbury County. But our success, we believe the success of the department is that we have local people providing the service that know the, know the terrain, know the people, know the situations, and... Um, I mean, I have people on my staff that we go somewhere to lunch, and they go, it's like going to lunch with the local scribe that knows everybody in town. So, yeah. Any other questions, thoughts? Well, it's obviously a big commitment, and it is a budget decision uh, we're being asked to make in, I assume, a week. I don't know. Yeah. We, the strategy is, is Chairman Ung and I talked about when this news first broke on Sioux Line Paramedics. Uh, I visited with the, the chair and I said, he called me that morning, matter of fact, before I could call him. And I said, here's what I think our strategy should be. Do you agree? And that was basically let the dust settle just a little bit because it was a big thud that hit the floor with that announcement. And then give me the chance to sort of categorize everything that was going to be impacted Get a list: jail, work calls, paramedic assists. Let's get that on a let's get that on a list, and then let's start sorting through. And uh, then I opened up dialogue with uh, the fire chief and with uh, Bob Welty down at Siouxland Paramedics and my counterparts in the region. And uh, you know, one of the things that right away we got asked about is if we put a couple more paramedics on, can we do paramedic assists up in the Plymouth County and down in the Monona County? And I'm like, as much as we would love to. These are going to be paid for by Woodbury County. In an extraordinary situation, we're not going to let somebody die out there. But every county at this point needs to step up to the plate and start making provisions for EMS in their county. It's a sad, I mean, it's just a matter of fact. Well, I don't think anybody here is against it. It's just like, where are we, how are we going to fund it right now? I mean, I, I mean, we can talk about this for quite a while, but the fact remains, nobody's against it, but... We just don't have the funding for it at the moment. I don't. Nobody wants to see anybody get hurt or die or no. have an accident. It's just. No, and it's not. And uh, what? And it's really just for us. It's we're trying to take this system and develop it into something. You know, we're we're working with a set of standards put out by the Iowa EMS Association system standards. We've been able to take them from fifty something to twenty something, so they're a manageable number. Now we're working together as a five county group at those standards and ways. How can we work together? in county and out of county to maybe reduce some of the cost of EMS and increase the number of people who want to be involved. We've got one program that we're looking at nurse exceptions. We've got a lot of nurses out here. Can we teach them to be in the back of an ambulance? The state allows them to work in the back of an ambulance. Can we teach them to be back there and do it safely? So we're actually, well, Ida Grove's looking at piloting a course with everybody else's support to teach a 20 hour course to, to nurses how to operate in the back of an ambulance. So, Everything creative we can come up with, we're doing. So. Yeah. Well, I appreciate it. I think the discussion tonight was very helpful. Um, we'll look for it to be back um, as an action item, and part of that may be um, looking at different options, looking at those answers, and, and then the board will make a decision. So appreciate it very much. Yeah. I mean, if, it's gonna, if, they, if we're going to get into a situation talking to Siouxland, if they say, hey, we're interested, then I 
we probably need to sit down with them and say, yeah. this is what we're interested well, in. Well, and I think we'll take your input and make sure that we're, we all know that we're comparing apples to apples and what the repercussions of anything will be. So, And just so I know, uh, although we may be looking at this this early, uh, Supervisor Hung mentioned it next week, there's not a rush like, I know you were talking January 2nd, but it's not like, hey, if this doesn't happen in seven days, I wouldn't want to put it off more than no. 14, but if we had to get some more information or whatever, that'd be all right. The budget too, number right? we put forward was for these people to start January 2nd. Okay. Because if, if we can hire good, experienced paramedics, they're going to be partnered with a very experienced EMT, and we can work with their training on the job. That's what we did with Jerry. Jerry came on the job. He was in the front seat of the truck. He took his first call 45 minutes into his first shift. So they're not going to stand around for a six-week training period. We can train them on the, on the, on the move and on the job. Okay. That's All right. Well, thank you very much, to that, Gary, both for uh, both items, and we'll get back on both. Also, uh, we'll keep talking on both. Pat shared with me today, Michelle's been involved in the donated vacation time thing, too, so I wanted to tell Michelle thanks. Okay, great. Thank you very much. All right. Well, we will uh, move on to uh, secondary roads, Mark and Ara. Uh, A is to consider the approval of resolution to set load limits on county bridges. I thought you were going to request like a half hour you know, recess or something since Mark's been waiting so patiently. And Mark gets really mad. He hits that podium and he breaks it. Breaks it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, did a little of that last weekend, so. All right. Um, got that out of my system. Okay, while. good. Um, what I have first is a uh, bridge embargo resolution. This is based on our 2017 bridge inspections. As you can see on the resolution, two bridges have been recommended to be closed to traffic because of failures of substructure items. Uh, V84-2 is one of our next three bridges coming down the design pike. Um, we've got it designed, we've got permit, we're just finishing up on final plans. Um, we're probably looking at a letting in the next two months to get that one taken care of. Uh, bridge U138, the other one listed for closure, is uh, a 2019 structure. So that one is going to be closed for better than a year before we'll have the money to look at replacement. Uh, we'll try and shuffle it around and maybe bring it forward a little bit in our program. It is about a $700,000 structure. It's large and long, and uh, we haven't figured out what we're going to need for uh, road grading yet on that one. So we don't even have uh, preliminary hydraulics, but we know the bridge just around the corner from it was a 243-foot beam bridge, and uh, we're anticipating the same type of structure on, to replace U-138. So uh, again, we'll try and move it forward as quick as we can. but. It's already posted three tons, so it should not impact harvest much, although the fact that the substructure is falling apart on us kind of indicates that people might be ignoring the weight limit. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. I'll move 11A. Second. There's been a motion on the second. Uh, motion by Radig, second by DeWitt. Uh, any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say no, and the motion carries five to zero. Item. One of the good things about this is this is one of the smallest lists we've come out with to the board. Right. So we're gradually starting to get all these aging structures knocked down and replaced. Very good. A B is to approve the contract and bond for project number L, CO7 parent 773 -97. Uh, this is for a uh, couple of culvert repairs on uh, County Road D54 in advance of our planned uh, Portland cement concrete overlay of uh, this road next year. Uh, Dixon Construction was the successful low bidder. Total contract cost $168,544.75. I recommend approval. Move it. Second. Second. There's a motion and a second. Uh, any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Those aye. opposed say no, and the motion carries five to zero. Item C, accept a proposal and approve the contract for Haskell Avenue bridge removal. Uh, with this project being under $50,000 estimated, uh, we took uh, quotes. We received uh, quotes back from three contractors. 
Uh, Dixon Construction was a low quote for $12,000. Uh, the other two quotes were $41,000 from Nelson and Rock Construction of Ottawa, Iowa, and $80,500 from Graves Construction of Spencer, Iowa. I recommend uh, uh, acceptance of the proposal and approval of the contract for the Haskell Avenue Bridge removal. I move acceptance of that proposal for Haskell Avenue Bridge removal. And, and the contract. And the contract. Second. There's a motion and a second. Any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed say no. And the motion carries. For the board's right information, right. work started today on 220th Street. The uh, sub base has all been uh, milled, reclaimed, packed into place. Tomorrow we'll be adding the uh, base stabilizer. Uh, Thursday, our seal code contractor is set to move in and uh, seal the surface on that. So we, uh, <coughs> we got lucky for once. Everything kind of came together uh, at the same time. So. All right. Back on for Micah. Take that. And uh, the Highway 141 bridge, we poured the deck last Wednesday. We'll do a beam break tomorrow, a seven day beam break. We should be able to get uh, bridge rail poured before the end of the week. Uh, pavement removal on the south end is uh, underway and probably three quarters done as of when we speak. So the contractor is uh, trying to make hay while the sun shines this week. Uh, we've got uh, five good days forecast and we're hoping to get a lot of work done this week so that project is running two weeks behind i say that because i know it's been one that the board members have gotten calls about and uh, we lost almost two weeks in that last week of september first week of october we had seven out of ten rain days where the contractor wasn't able to get much done so. monsoon season it seemed like it um, they were talking how that uh, seven inches of rain total was a good deal more than we were accustomed to seeing at this time of the all right, well, thank you very much, Mark. I think I have everything there for you. Thank you. Uh, item 12, Building Services, uh, Kenny Schmitz. A is approval of the Law Enforcement Center HVAC repairs, jail cell areas, nine zones. Uh, the item you have before you uh, are, are the repair for nine zones, uh, HVAC, HVAC zones at the LEC. Um, in the jail cell areas, uh, of the facility, we have not been able to control temperatures uh, since at least the time that uh, I've been employed at Woodbury County. Um, we've looked into that uh, with the CW Suter and Baker Group's assistance. Uh, Building Services looked into this to see what the problem might be. We thought originally that could possibly uh, be a valve somewhere that was unidentified by us that we couldn't find in a, in a, in a location that uh, we weren't aware of. Um, uh, so we did some in-depth uh, looking to see what the problem might be. Unfortunately, we found that there wasn't uh, one or two problems, but there was nine altogether. Um, at some point in time, uh, the original systems uh, and original controls were removed from the uh, actual main control system and they were set up as standalone controls. In other words, uh, we don't have any control over them uh, through the system and they are, they're all out here operating on their own. Unfortunately, they're not operating on their own. They're not operating at all in, in nine circumstances. And so now we're asking to go in and uh, repair some valves, uh, replace valves and replace some controls uh, and bring those uh, areas uh, back into the main system where eventually we hope to be able to uh, control those and see what they're doing. Thank you very much for that explanation. Is there discussion? So, is this something that it was budgeted for previously and it's coming from a CAP? This was not previously budgeted for, and I see Dennis isn't here, but I've discussed this with him. It would, it would be a 2018 budget amendment. Yeah, and so the question had come before me as uh, acting chair on how we want to delineate this, if we want to take this from other CIP projects. My recommendation was not to because this... 
typically for me, CIP, uh, Capital Improvement Projects, is going to have a length of years um, that you're borrowing monies for. Um, this to me is more along the lines of a repair expense and I think um, is appropriate to do through a budget amendment. So there's two roads that diverge in the wood and that's the one I would recommend. So with that, I'll, I would move to approve the Star Control LEC HVAC repairs in the amount of $34,628. Second. There's a motion and a second. This will take a 2018 budget amendment by Dennis who had to leave. Um, what was the estimate on this again? 36. Sorry. Six. What was your estimate cost again? Uh, the estimated cost is $34,628 for star controls and $5,194 uh, for construction management with Baker Group. And those in two separate motions you already did. So we have the first motion for the star control um, and a second. Uh, all those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed say no, and the motion carries five to zero. I'd also move to approve the Baker Group as construction manager in the amount of $5,194. Second. Is there discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed say no, and the motion carries five to zero. And finally, 12B is approval of the Prairie Hills Training Center Project Lease Purchase Agreement. Kenny? Uh, we finally uh, come upon the total figures and calculations uh, for the lease, lease purchase agreement uh, for the new Prairie Hills Training Center. Uh, we did make some adjustments uh, in, in coming to those final costs. Um, a couple of the things we did is we, com we completely uh, or did a total segregation from the old building, and by that I mean we segregated all the utilities uh, the electrical, uh, septic systems, and potable water systems. Uh, we did that to make a clean break from the old system uh, to allow the board to uh, make future decisions of any kind that they'd like to with the old facility. And to also, um, uh, as far as the electrical uh, portion went, we, we reduced from Freddy Volt 3 phase to 12240 volt single phase, uh, which uh, takes away the demand charges that Mid American charges. So in the future, that'll reduce our, hopefully, reduce our monthly electrical costs with the new facility. Um, we also got away from the uh, current well and potable water system in the old building. We could have tied into it, uh, but we currently have to do uh, uh, monthly. Uh, inspections and a certified water operator has to do that for us. It's about uh, $210 for each inspection. And so we thought it was a good point to try to break away from that so we didn't have to do that uh, monthly DNR reporting. Um, so we'll uh, be installing a new well so that'll also separate that utility. So uh, we'll, we will have a completely segregated building. Um, the total cost is $569,614.20. Uh, the estimated quarterly payments are $28,480.71 71 cents. Um, interest rate is 3.25%. Um, and I'd be willing to answer uh, or try to answer any questions you might have. Are there questions from the board? What's the biggest load out there since we had three phase on Prairie Hills? What's probably just the HVAC system out there? The That's correct. That would be the biggest. What, what needed three phase on the old building? The boilers or? The, it was on the HVAC system. Okay. Yes. And what what is the are the rough top units or that are going on the new building? Yeah, they'll be. Um, They'll be, they won't be a chiller system. They'll be more like a, a commercial building uh, AC system where you've got a condenser and an evaporator, somewhat similar to what you have in your homes. Okay. All right. Uh, other questions, thoughts? Hearing none, all those. Oh, well, let's have a motion first. Um, forgive me. Motion to all move to approve the Prairie Hills Lease Purchase Agreement and Documents. 
funding in the amount of $569,614.20 and authorizes the Board of Supervisors Chairman and Vice Chairman to execute the final legal lease purchase documents as required. I do. It's okay. all right here. Second. Would you want to say and or? Well, do you need, do you need both of us? We do. We do need both of you. And also, um, I'd like to, if possible, ask Chairman Ung uh, and yourself, Mr. Taylor, what date you might be available next week. Um, I've got to put a specific date of signature on the contract. Well, I'm around. Uh, uh, Supervisor Ung, did you hear the question? Next Monday. Next Monday? Yes. By next, you mean this or next? I always get that confused. This, this coming okay. Monday. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yep, so I'll be around Monday as well. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those aye. opposed say no, and the motion carries uh, five to zero. Thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate it, Kenny. Um, someday we'll reward you by putting you in the beginning of the agenda. Item 13, Chairman's Report. Um, I don't have a whole lot other than uh, just please get uh, agenda items to be timely and we'll get them uh, in the next agenda ready. We did not have a department head meeting. Uh, I was uh, otherwise occupied, so I was actually taking county notes on the back of this. So I, uh, I had a little girl last Congratulations. week. Congratulations. Thank you very much. And if her name, if it was a boy, it was going to be Ian Ellie, but uh, it was a girl, so Irene. So that's the chairman's report. Um, that may be the last baby for me, but we'll see. Item 14, reports on committee meetings. Anyone? Um, you'll see I put the health and wellness committee minutes and uh, the background if you're interested. There's some good information there, um, and you can read those. And that's about it. All right, citizen concerns, item 15. Board concerns, item 16. Hearing none, we are adjourned. Thank you very much.